Chapter 13. Production Time Working time is always production time, i.e. time during which capital is confined to the production sphere. But it is not true, conversely, that the entire time for which capital exists in the production process is necessarily, therefore, working time. What is at issue here are not interruptions in the labor process conditioned by the natural limits of labor power itself, even though we have seen the extent to which the mere fact that fixed capital, factory buildings, machinery, etc., lies idle during the pauses in the labor process became one of the motives for the unnatural extension of the labor process and for the working day and night. What is involved is rather an interruption independent of the length of the labor process, an interruption conditioned by the nature of the product and its production, during which the object of labor is subjected to natural processes of shorter or longer duration and has to undergo physical, chemical, or physiological changes while the labor process is either completely or partially suspended. After grapes have been pressed, for instance, the wine must go through a period of fermentation and then also rest for a while before it reaches a certain degree of readiness. In many branches of industry, the product must undergo a process of drying, as in pottery, or else be exposed to certain conditions in order to change its chemical properties, as with bleaching. Winter corn seeds nine months or so to ripen. Between seed time and harvest, the labor process is almost completely interrupted. In the raising of timber, once planting and the preliminary work connected with this is completed, the seed may need a hundred years to be transformed into a finished product. During this whole time, only a relatively very insignificant intervention of labor is needed. In all these cases, additional labor is added only occasionally for a large part of the production time. The situation described in the previous chapter, where additional capital and labor has to be added to capital already tied up in the production process, occurs here only with interruptions of a greater or lesser extent. In all these cases, therefore, the production time of the capital advanced consists of two periods, a period in which the capital exists in the labor process and a second period in which its form of existence, that of an unfinished product, is handed over to the sway of natural processes, without being involved in the labor process. This situation is not altered if the two periods of time occasionally cut across one another or are interspersed. Here, the working period and the production period do not coincide. The production period is longer than the working period, but it is only after the production period has been left behind that the product is finished and mature and can thus be transformed from the form of productive capital into that of commodity capital. The turnover period is then extended according to the length of that part of the production time that does not consist of working time. Insofar as this time of production, over and above the labor time, is not determined by natural laws given once and for all, as with the ripening of corn, the growth of an oak, etc., the turnover period can often be shortened to a greater or lesser extent by the artificial shortening of the production time. Examples of this are the introduction of chemical in place of open-air bleaching, and the more effective drying apparatus in the drying processes. In tanning, the penetration of tannic acid into the skins, which used to take between 6 and 18 months with the old method, only takes one and a half to two months with the new method involving the use of the air pump. The most far-reaching example of artificial shortening of a production time made up exclusively of natural processes is given by the history of iron production over the last 100 years, from the invention of puddling in 1780 to the modern Bessemer process and the latest procedures introduced since then. The production time has been enormously curtailed, but the application of fixed capital has also increased to the same extent. A peculiar example of the divergence between production time and working time is provided by the American manufacture of shoe lasts. Here, a significant part of the expense arises from the wood having to dry out in store for up to 18 months, so that the finished lasts do not warp. During this time, the wood does not undergo any other labor process. The turnover period of the capital applied is therefore not only determined by the time required to produce the last themselves, but also by the time for which the capital has to lie idle in the shape of wood which is being dried out. The capital exists in the production process for 18 months before it can enter the labor process proper. This example also shows how the turnover times of various parts of the total circulating capital may differ as a result of circumstances that arise from the production sphere and not from the circulation sphere. The distinction between production time and working time is particularly important in agriculture. In our temperate climates, the land brings forth grain once a year. The shortening or lengthening of the production period, an average of nine months for winter sowing, is itself dependent on the alternation of good and bad years, and hence cannot be precisely determined in advance and controlled, as in industry proper. Only subsidiary products, such as milk, cheese, etc., can be produced and sold continuously in short periods. But the working time is in the following quite different situation. Quote, the number of working days for the three main working periods is assumed to be as follows in different districts of Germany, with respect to the climatic and other conditions involved. 
the spring period from mid-March, or the beginning of April, up to the middle of May, 50 to 60 days. The summer period from early June to late August, 65 to 80 days. The autumn period from early September to the end of October or middle or late November, 55 to 75 days. As far as winter goes, there is simply the work suited to that period, such as the haulage of fertilizer, wood, goods for the market, building materials, etc. End quote from Kirchhoff. Thus, the more unfavorable the climate, the more the agricultural working period, and hence the outlay of capital and labor, is compressed into a short interval, as, for example, in Russia. Quote, in some of the northern districts, field labor is only possible during from 130 to 150 days in the course of the year, and it may be imagined what a loss Russia would sustain if out of 65 million of her European population, 50 million remained unoccupied during six or eight months of winter, when all agricultural labor is at a standstill. End quote. Besides the 200,000 peasants who work in Russia's 10,500 factories, particular cottage industries have grown up everywhere in the villages. Quote, there are villages, for instance in Russia, in which all the peasants have been for generations either weavers, tanners, shoemakers, locksmiths, cutlers, etc. End quote. This is particularly the case in the gubernias of Moscow, Vladimir, Kaluga, Kostroma, and St. Petersburg. These cottage industries, incidentally, are already being pressed more and more into the service of capitalist production. For example, merchants supply the weavers with warps and weft, either directly or by intermediate agents. Abbreviated by reports from HM secretaries of embassy and legation, on the manufacturers, commerce, etc. We see here how the distinction between production period and working period, with the latter forming only a part of the former, constitutes the natural basis for the unification of agriculture with rural subsidiary industries, just as these, in turn, are points of vantage for the capitalist, who first intrudes in his capacity as merchant. Insofar as capitalist production later manages to complete the separation between manufacture and agriculture, the rural worker becomes ever more dependent on the merely accidental subsidiary employments and his condition thereby worsens. As far as capital is concerned, as we shall see later on, all these differences in the turnover balance out. Not so for the worker. In most branches of industry proper, as well as in mining, transport, etc., production proceeds evenly and the same working time is worked year in and year out, apart from fluctuations of price, disturbances of business, etc., and abnormal interruptions, the outlay of capital going into the daily circulation process is evenly distributed. While market conditions remain the same, therefore, the reflux or renewal of circulating capital is distributed over the whole year in equal portions. However, in those investments of capital where working time forms only one part of the production time, there was a great unevenness in the outlay of circulating capital in the course of the different periods of the year, inasmuch as the reflux only follows, at one stroke, at a time prescribed by natural conditions. On a given scale of business, therefore, i.e. with the same volume of circulating capital advanced, this must be advanced in larger amounts at once, and for a longer time, than in those businesses with continuous working periods. The life of fixed capital is significantly different here from the time in which it actually functions productively. With this difference between working time and production time, the time during which the fixed capital is utilized is of course constantly interrupted for a longer or shorter interval. In agriculture, for instance, with the use of draft cattle, implements, and machines. Insofar as this fixed capital consists of draft animals, it continues to require the same, or almost the same, outlay on fodder, etc., as during the time in which it operates. In the case of dead means of labor, non-use also gives rise to certain depreciation. The product thus always becomes dearer, since the transfer of value to the product is not calculated according to the time for which the fixed capital functions, but rather according to the time in which it loses value. In these branches of production, it is a condition of normal use that fixed capital should lie idle, whether or not this still involves running costs, just as in spinning a condition of normal use is the loss of a certain quantity of cotton, and in the same way, in every labor process, the labor power expended unproductively, but unavoidably so under normal technical conditions, counts just as much as the productive. Every improvement that reduces the unproductive expenditure of means of labor, raw materials and labor power, also reduces the value of the product. In agriculture, the two things are combined, the long duration of the working period and a great difference between working time and production time. Hodgskin correctly notes on this point, quote, The difference of time although he does not differentiate here between working time and production time, required to complete the products of agriculture and of other species of labor is the main cause of the great dependence of the agriculturalists. They cannot bring their commodities to market in less time than a year. For that whole period, they are obliged to borrow of the shoemaker, the tailor, the smith, the wheelwright, and the various other laborers 
whose products they cannot dispense with, but which are completed in a few days or weeks. Owing to this natural circumstance, and owing to the more rapid increase of the wealth produced by other labor than that of agriculture, the monopolizers of all the land, though they have also monopolized legislation, have not been able to save themselves and their servants, the farmers, from becoming the most dependent class of men in the community. End quote from Hodgskin, Popular Political Economy, published in London in 1827. All methods in agriculture, which on the one hand distribute expenditure on wages and means of labor more evenly over the whole year, and on the other hand shorten the turnover by diversifying the products and thus making different crops possible during the year, require an increase in the circulating capital laid out on production, on wages, fertilizer, seed, etc. This is the case with the transition from the three-field system, with fallow, to the system of crop rotation without fallow. Also with the undersowing system in Flanders. Quote, the root crops are planted by undersowing. The same field first bears corn, flax, or rapeseed for human requirements, and then after the harvest, root crops are sown for the maintenance of the cattle. This system, which enables the horned cattle to remain permanently in the stall, produces a considerable amount of manure and is thus the cornerstone of crop rotation. More than a third of the cultivated area in the sandy districts is undersown in this way. It is just as if the cultivated land has been extended by a third. End quote. Besides root crops, clover and other fodder is also used here. Quote, Agriculture, being thus carried to the point at which it is transformed into horticulture, understandably requires a relatively considerable capital investment. In England, the sum reckoned with is 250 francs of investment capital to the hectare. In Flanders, our farmers will probably find an investment capital of 500 francs per hectare far too low. End quote from Essays on the Belgian Ruled Economies, published in Brussels in 1863. Let us finally consider timber raising. Quote, the production of timber is fundamentally different from most others in that here natural forces work independently, and the power of men or capital is not required for natural growth. Even where forests are artificially cultivated, the amount of human and capital power expended in comparison with the section of natural forces is only slight. Furthermore, forests will thrive in types of soil in places where grain cannot grow, or where it no longer pays to produce it. Forest culture, however, requires a greater surface area than the cultivation of grain if it is to be conducted on a regular commercial basis. Since small plots do not allow proper forestry methods, the secondary uses are abandoned, and forest protection is made more difficult, etc. The production process is also tied to such a long period of time that it extends beyond the plans of a private undertaking, and sometimes even beyond a single human life. Capital invested in the acquisition of forest land, in communal production, this capital disappears and the question is simply how much land the community can withdraw from arable and grazing land for timber production, only bears fruit after a comparatively long period of time, and turns over only partially, taking up to 150 years in the case of many types of wood. Moreover, effective timber production actually requires a reserve stock of growing timber amounting to between 10 and 40 times the annual yield. Thus, someone who does not have other income or possess substantial areas of forest cannot pursue regular forestry. End quote from Kirchhoff. The long production time, which includes a relatively slight amount of working time, and the consequent length of the turnover period, makes forest culture a line of business unsuited to private, and hence to capitalist, production, the latter being fundamentally a private operation, even when the associated capitalist takes the place of the individual. The development of civilization, and industry in general, has always shown itself so active in the destruction of forests that everything that has been done for their conservation and production is completely insignificant in comparison. Particularly worthy of note in the quotation from Kirchhoff is the following passage. Moreover, effective timber production actually requires a reserve stock of timber amounting to between 10 and 40 times the annual yield. Thus the turnover takes from 10 years up to 40 and more. It is the same with cattle raising. Part of the herd, cattle stock, remains in the production process, while another part is sold as the annual product. Here, only one part of the capital turns over each year, just as in the case of the fixed capital, machinery, draft cattle, etc. Even though this capital is fixed for a longer time of the production process, and thus lengthens the turnover of the total capital, it does not constitute fixed capital in the categorical sense. What is referred to here as a stock a definite quantity of growing wood or cattle, exists partially in the production process, both as means of labor and material of labor, depending on the natural conditions of its reproduction, a significant part must always exist in this form in the case of regular cultivation. A further kind of stock has a similar effect on the turnover. 
a stock that forms only potential productive capital, but has to be accumulated in larger or smaller amounts as a result of the nature of agriculture, and must be advanced to production for a relatively long time even though it enters the active production process only bit by bit. This includes manure, for example, before it is carted to the field, as well as corn, hay, etc., and any stocks of feed that go into the production of cattle. Quote, a considerable part of the working capital is contained in the stocks of the business. These can lose their value to a greater or lesser extent if the appropriate measures of protection required for their maintenance and good order are not taken. A part of the production stock can even be completely lost to the business by lack of attention. What is principally required in this connection is painstaking attention to the barns, fodder, and grain lofts and cellars, the storage places that must always be kept well closed and also kept clean, ventilated, etc. The grain and other crops kept in store must be thoroughly turned over from time to time, and potatoes and beets protected against frost, water, and rot. End quote from Kirchhoff. Quote, in calculating one's own requirements, particularly for cattle, in which connection a division must be made according to the measure of the product and the intended use, attention must be paid not only to covering requirements, but also to having sufficient stock left over for unforeseen contingencies. As soon as it appears that the need cannot be fully met by one's own production, it is necessary to take into consideration whether this lack cannot be covered by other products, substitutes, or whether these cannot be procured more cheaply in place of the missing products. If there should be a lack of hay, for example, this can be made up by root crops with added straw. In general, the material value and market price of the different products must be constantly borne in mind, and the consumption regulated accordingly. If oats are dearer, for instance, while peas and rye are relatively cheap, then it will be advantageous to replace some of the oats for the horses with peas and rye, and sell the superfluous oats. End quote. In considering the formation of stock, we have already noted that a greater or lesser quantity of potential productive capital is required, i.e. a quantity of means of production destined for production, which has to be held in reserve in a greater or lesser amount in order to go into the production process bit by bit. We noted in this connection that with a capital investment of a given scale, the size of this production stock depends on the greater or lesser difficulty of its replacement, its relative proximity to the supplying markets, the development of means of transport and communication, etc. All these circumstances affect the minimum capital that must exist in the form of productive stock, and thus the period of time for which advances of capital have to be made, and the volume of capital that has to be advanced at once. This volume, which also has an effect on the turnover, is determined by the longer or shorter time for which circulating capital is tied up in the form of productive stock, as only potentially productive capital. On the other hand, insofar as the extent of this stagnation depends on the greater or lesser possibility of rapid replacement, on market conditions, etc., it itself arises from the circulation time, from circumstances that pertain to the circulation sphere. Quote, Moreover, a stock of all these implements or accessories, working tools, sieves, baskets, ropes, axle grease, nails, etc., is all the more necessary for replacement at any moment, the less opportunity there is of procuring them quickly in the vicinity. Finally, the entire inventory should be carefully inspected each winter, and the necessary additions and repairs immediately put in hand. Whether a larger or smaller stock of implements is generally needed is principally determined by local conditions. Where there are no craftsmen or shops in the vicinity, a greater stock must be kept than where these are to be found in the locality or very close by. If the requisite stocks are procured in greater quantities at once, under otherwise similar conditions, the advantage and cheap purpose is generally obtained, provided that a suitable point of time has been chosen, but of course a greater sum is then withdrawn at once from the current capital, which cannot always be dispensed with in the business. End quote from Kirchhoff. The difference between production time and working time, as we have seen, permits a wide range of possibilities. The circulating capital can be in its production time before it enters the actual labor process, as in the manufacture of lasts. It may be still in production time after it has undergone the actual labor process, as in with wine and seed corn. The production time may be occasionally interrupted by labor time, as in field crops and timber, or a large part of the product in a condition ready for circulation may remain incorporated in the active production process, while a much smaller part enters into the annual circulation, as in timber and cattle growing. The greater or lesser length of time, thus the greater or lesser measure in which the circulating capital has to be laid out all at once in the form of potential productive capital, partly arises from the kind of production process, as in agriculture, and partly depends on the proximity of markets, etc. In short, on circumstances that belong to the circulation sphere. We shall see later on, in Volume 3, what nonsensical theories McCulloch, James Mill, etc. were led to in their attempts to identify this production time diverging from working time with working time.
attempts which in their turn arose from an incorrect application of the theory of value. The turnover cycle that we considered previously is a function of the durability of the fixed capital advance to the production process. Since this encompasses a greater or smaller number of years, it also encompasses a series of turnovers of the fixed capital, repeated either yearly or within a year. In agriculture, a turnover cycle of this kind arises from the system of crop rotation. Quote, the duration of the lease must in any case not be shorter than the time taken to complete the system of crop rotation that is introduced, and hence with a three-field system it is always reckoned in terms of three, six, nine, etc. If we assume the three-field system with complete fallow, the field is cultivated only four times in six years, and in the years cultivated, with both winter and summer grain, the properties of the soil also require or permit this to be alternated between wheat and rye, barley and oats. Each kind of grain grows in the same soil better or worse than the others. Each has a different value and is also sold at a different price. The yield of the land thus varies with the years of cultivation. It is different in the first half of the cycle, in the first three years, and in the second. Even the average yield over the whole cycle is not the same in the one case as in the other, since fertility does not just depend on the quality of the soil, but also on the year's weather, the price also depending on many different conditions. If the yield is calculated on the basis of the average years of the entire cycle of six years, and of the average prices in these years, then the total yield for one year can be arrived at for either period of the rotation. But this is not the case if the yield is only calculated for half of the rotation, i.e. for three years, since then the total yield would not be the same. It is evident from this that the duration of the lease in the three-field system must be fixed at at least six years. It is always far more desirable for both landlord and tenant that the lease should run for a multiple of the lease, and thus instead of six years in the case of the three-field system, it should be twelve or eighteen years or more. And in the case of the seven-field system, not seven but fourteen or twenty-eight. End quote from Kirchhoff.